Well, good morning. I'm Dr. Gerald Christensen, and uh, this morning I'm interviewing uh, Dr. Stanley Trulson, and we're here in the luxurious third floor of the um, Trulson Eye Institute. And we're located on the University of Nebraska Medical Center campus here in Omaha. Dr. Trulson uh, grew up in rural Nebraska and um, was very well known in ophthalmology as a teacher, a clinician, and for many reasons also included being a very generous benefactor to the American Academy of Ophthalmology as well as uh, the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So to begin with, Stan, uh, if I may call you Stan. You may. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and you have in the past. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, tell us a little bit about your background and um, where you grew up and where you went from there. Okay, I'll uh, begin at the beginning. I was born and raised in Herman, Nebraska, a small town of about uh, 375 people. It's halfway between Blair and Tecama here in the eastern edge of Nebraska. Attended Herman High School. Uh, during the uh, Depression, I was lucky to be able to go to Lincoln to the University of Nebraska, where I uh, took my pre-med and uh, then was also fortunate and lucky to be accepted to uh, the medical school. It's interesting at that time, Dr. Pointer was the dean, but he was also the admissions committee. And uh, it's kind of interesting, and this is an aside, I was late getting in my application and my father-in-law to be said, does your father know any of several doctors? And I said, yes, he knows Dr. Morris Nielsen in Blair, Nebraska. He said, go talk to him. So a uh, few week before medical school started, Dad and I went to see Dr. Nielsen, who was also my father's physician, and told him that uh, we were kind of aced out of the uh, class because of my late uh, application. And Dr. Nielsen leaned over and picked up his phone and dialed the the dean's number and said, Charlie, how are you? How are the kids? Uh, where, where, are you, where are you vacationing this year? And carried on a personal conversation for a few minutes and said, uh, I've got a boy up here that I'd like to get in medical school. He said, fine, I'll tell him. He turned to me and he said, be there Monday morning. And wow. uh, that was my uh, lucky ad admission <laughs> to the University of Nebraska College of Medicine. By the way, it was a college then, part of the university, such as the Ag College and the Business College and various ones. It wasn't until later that it became a campus of its own with its own uh, uh, chancellor. We had a dean here, and uh, he was just like the dean of the law college, part of the, the whole uh, administration which was centered in Lincoln. This is just an off-campus off college. Well, tell us a little bit about um, later on uh, during medical school and afterwards, and, and I know you had some military training. It was during the time of World War II. Well, I was very fortunate. That uh, was the summer of uh, 1941 when this transpired with Dr. Nielsen. So our class started in September of 1941. And of course, a couple of months later, Pearl Harbor occurred. We were at a loss as to what might happen to us. A few weeks later, uh, the government stated that they would be taking over all medical education and started a uh, a program called the uh, ASTP, Army Student Training uh, uh, Program. 
uh, came in and you either went into the Army or the Navy if you could pass your physical. Most of our class went into the Army, but we had a few Navy uh, and then a couple of poor fellows who couldn't pass physical continued in school. They couldn't get into service anyway, but they had to pay their own tuition. Really? We uh, were paid as a private for a few months, and then we were made a private first class, which paid us $140 a month. We dressed in Army uniforms, had reveille every morning, marched in parades, had platoons and uh, kind of lived uh, as uh, a military life in medical school, going to classes. Of course, uh, because the government was uh, following us, you didn't dare miss a class or uh, uh, behave in a manner that was uh, not acceptable to the Army. We were also accelerated, and we started in uh, September of uh, 41, and our class graduated, was the first one to graduate in three years instead of four. We graduated on September 23rd of 1944. So following uh, that accelerated program, we went into an accelerated internship, which was nine months instead of uh, 12. I was again fortunate at the termination of my internship, I applied for a a residency in pathology at Albany Medical School and uh, was uh, awarded uh, another nine-month uh, residence in uh, pathology before I uh, uh, went into the service. All of us who were taken into the service were committed to a minimum of two years of military service after completion of our internship or residency. After I finished uh, my uh, pathology residency, uh, I um, waited for my military orders and they didn't come and I was anxious to get started. And it's interesting that I finally decided to go talk to my congressman who was from Omaha. His name was Buffett. He was a very conservative Republican uh, congressman and he listened to my story and uh, a week or two later I got my orders to uh, enter the uh, medical corps of the United States Army. I was assigned to a terrible place, Camp Polk, Louisiana, out in the sticks and swamps where there had been training prior to uh, World War II. As a matter of fact, Eisenhower and Patton did their early tank training in that area. I was assigned as a uh, laboratory officer in the base hospital because of my uh, path training. And uh, a few months later, it was determined that Camp Polk would be closed down. I. Uh, had had just barely time to bring my family to Louisiana and uh, all of a sudden we had to pack up and send them back to Omaha while I was transferred to uh, a uh, enlisting station in Midwest City, Oklahoma. Well, you um, seemed like you were on a course to be a pathologist, but you wound up as an ophthalmologist. So uh, well. how did that occur? I took pathology, uh, uh, pathology residency as I intended to go into internal medicine or general surgery. And I thought pathology would be a good basis for it. Uh, so uh, during my pathology residency, we had an excellent technician who uh, did soloidin sections as a type of uh, a preparation of tissue to study it microscopically. And she also did soloid sections for the eyes that were removed during, in the hospital during that time. As I studied the various diseases of the eye, I became more and more uh, interested in the uh, specialty. Had to consult in the library and the journals uh, uh, various uh, sources for 
learning ophthalmology and became interested enough that I decided that that would be a, uh, a good uh, specialty and I would like to uh, enter it. Also, I figured out that uh, learning about uh, uh, ophthalmology and the eyeball, which is about an inch in si diameter, was a little easier than studying for the whole body, which is, uh, has various organs and, and uh, the brain, the liver, and uh, so forth. Lots of information, though, even for just that uh, one square. Well, thing. for that one, one little uh, organ, the eye, I later bought a 15-volume set of, uh, of books uh, written by a world-famous uh, English ophthalmologist. So even though it was a small area, 15 volumes to write about it. Yeah, that was Sir Duke, uh, Stuart Duke Elder, I believe. Duke Elder. I met him while I was a resident in uh, St. Louis. Well, um, when you first... Um, uh, when you first finished your residency in ophthalmology and uh, came here, could you tell us a little bit about the uh, location of the clinic and what, what sort of resources you had uh, for running a clinic? Yeah, I, I finished the uh, residency and, and uh, strangely enough, three of us were able to take our written exam for the American Board of Ophthalmology before we finished our residency. Wow because one of the members of the staff was on the board and he arranged that for us. And uh, <clears throat> I finished my residency in, uh, in June of uh, 51 and the academy was uh, in uh, the fall of 51 and the three of us were able to finish our orals for the American Board of Ophthalmology that year. So I was only in practice about three months before I uh, was awarded my diplomat of the American Board of Ophthalmology. I came to Omaha to practice, although Dr. Post, who was the one that was on the board, offered me a position with him as an associate in St. Louis. I came home, so to speak. I knew before I left that Dr. Howard Morrison, who was a well-known ophthalmologist in, uh, in Omaha and on the faculty of the medical school, uh, was willing to accept me as an associate. His other associate was my future father-in-law, Dr. Haney, who was an otolaryngologist. So when I finished my uh, training in St. Louis, I uh, chose to come to Omaha. Dr. Haney retired, and so Dr. Morrison and I continued at 1500 Medical Arts Building, downtown Omaha, where the uh, Omaha National Bank now stands. Uh, we practiced there for a few years and then moved to the South Doctors Building on the campus with Clarkson Hospital. And uh, one of the first things I did on uh, moving to Omaha was buy, apply for the faculty uh, on, in ophthalmology at the medical school. The <coughs> chairman of the department at that time was Dr. Judd. We had a very active volunteer faculty, no full-time people, and the eye clinic as well as the otolaryngology clinic were on the second floor of what uh, we called the South Building. It was a lar fairly large room with little cubicles on the side. We had a slit lamp and a, a machine for visual fields and, and we conducted uh, glaucoma clinic, motility clinic, general eye clinic, all in that one room. I was assigned uh, at first uh, a uh, glaucoma clinic and I came over and supervised that clinic a half day a week, uh, Friday afternoon for three months at a time. Then I was laid off and somebody else took it and then we rotated through. I later was uh, uh, assigned to the motility clinic. We did have the beginnings of the subspecialties uh, although we didn't consider them as that, but uh, they were taken care of in the uh, eye clinic as, as uh, general ophthalmology or glaucoma or pediatric ophthalmology. Well, you kind of eventually uh, honed in on uh, motility and... As, well, I was, I was fortunate in my residency to have Dick Scobie as one of my uh, 
my instructors and teachers and professors, he wrote a couple of books on uh, motility that were very clear. And famous, he was famous books. Doctor. He was he was the uh, best instructor I ever had as far as his ability to lecture and describe complicated problems in uh, in motility. And uh, matter of fact, uh, he inscribed one of his books to me as. Uh, to stand a good muscle man. <laughs> so I did uh, quite a bit of motility when I first came back and practiced. Although in those days uh, we didn't have the, <coughs> the subspecialties in practice. There was no one in Omaha that was in a particular subspecialty. We all did general ophthalmology. We did glaucoma, we did cataracts, we did uh, uh, squints and, and crossed eyes and plastics and uh, the whole uh, the whole works. Uh, matter of fact, uh, Dr. John Pemberton trained in, in uh, retina in Boston and was the first uh, ophthalmologist to come to Omaha and he uh, uh, indicated trained, that he was a specialist in retina. In retina. <clears throat> so uh, the uh, it was fun to be able to do all those things, but the, that was the, kind of the beginning of the subspecialty era. Yes, I remember uh, when I finished my residency uh, and started out, we did everything. Yes. At uh, the times uh, uh, changed uh, gradually in uh, the various uh, the various fields. Now you had some. Uh, we had a residency training program. Um, I think started around the um, mid-1940s, and uh, you were involved with that as well? No, Dr. Judd was chairman, and he started the residency training program here at the University of Nebraska. Uh, Lawrence Gridley and Frank Eagle were the first residents, and that was in 46. Okay. They went, as a matter of fact, to uh, St. Louis, where we had a uh, a nine-month rather intensive basic course in ophthalmology in which they taught all the various things. We used, the residents also sat in on the, those courses and we used Duke Elder as our textbook and uh, we read and were quizzed on various aspects of uh, that. So those two fellows started the residency program and uh, then we had uh, a continuing uh, a uh, number of uh, local ophthalmologists, Dr. Filkins trained and uh, various ones, uh, Dury, Dr. Dury trained at the, uh, under Dr. Judd here. Dr. Gifford, <coughs> going back to doc, senior Dr. Gifford back at the turn of the century, had a training program, but those, uh, those people who uh, many of whom later joined him in practice, were really um, trained in his office and went to, with him to the operating room and uh, learned their surgery uh, by assisting Dr. Gifford. And the residency programs didn't come on till a good deal later. Well, I remember when I um, was recruited to come here, one of the first people who interviewed me was um, uh, Dr. Frank Eagle, and um, and also um, Dr. Filkins, yes. as well. I had to. Uh, they had both to, trained here. Yes, so I had to uh, uh, pass the test with both those fellows. Well, they had some good people. Yes, they picked some good. Uh, well, anyway. After a few years in the South Building, we moved the eye clinic over into the hospital building in the third floor wing. We took one wing. We had uh, the various examining rooms. We had a path lab. Dr. Gifford was uh, interested in, uh, in pathology, eye pathology. We had a very active uh, group of teachers that were all volunteer staff. There were no uh, full-time faculty. As a matter of fact, there were only about two full-time people on the whole medical school. 
faculty at that time in pediatrics and OB. So we didn't have any full time. All of the teaching for the medical students was done by volunteers. They came to the clinics, they lectured uh, uh, to the uh, medical students, although Dr. Judd did a lot of the lecturing himself. And uh, we had a uh, Wednesday morning conference that Dr. Morrison started and all the volunteer faculty as well as the residents attended that and uh, the residents might give a paper or we might have an internist talk about diabetes or we might have uh, various other specialties talk to us about the uh, relationship with ophthalmology and it, was, it worked very well and it was a good teaching program. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Dr. Gifford's successor uh, was not too interested in that type of thing and that Wednesday morning uh, program gradually faded away. Well, I remember when I um, was recruited to come here, one of the first people who interviewed me was um, uh, Dr. Frank Eagle. And, um, and also, um, Dr. Filkins yes. as well, I had to... Uh, they both to, trained here. Yes, and I had to uh, <coughs> uh, pass the test with both those fellows. Well, they had some good people. Yes. They picked some good... Uh, well, anyway, after a few years in the South Building, we moved the eye clinic over into the hospital building and the third floor wing, we took one wing. We had uh, the various examining rooms. We had a path lab. Dr. Gifford was uh, interested in, uh, in pathology, eye pathology. We had a very active uh, group of teachers that were all volunteer staff. There were no uh, full-time faculty. As a matter of fact, there were only about two full-time people on the whole medical school faculty at that time in pediatrics and OB. So we didn't have any full-time. All of the teaching for the medical students was done by volunteers. They came to the clinics. They lectured uh, uh, to the uh, medical students, although Dr. Judd did a lot of the lecturing himself. And uh, we had a... Uh, Wednesday morning conference that Dr. Morrison started and all the volunteer faculty as well as the residents attended that and uh, the residents might give a paper or we might have an internist talk about diabetes or we might have uh, various other specialties talk to us about the uh, relationship with ophthalmology and it, was, it worked very well and it was a good teaching program. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Dr. Gifford's successor uh, was not too interested in that type of thing and that Wednesday morning uh, program gradually faded away. Well, Dr. Gifford uh, was uh, one of the primary people who recruited me to come here because we both shared this interest in ophthalmic pathology. And um, I, I've been to a number of of regional and national meetings um, with Dr. Gifford and we got to be pretty good friends. So, and he was very, very supportive of our laboratory um, set up and um, promoting uh, ophthalmic pathology um, as a uh, subspecialty of, of the department. So I'm very grateful for uh, Dr. Gifford's help, especially when the, uh, in the pathology I'm sector. smiling because uh, it was my intent to continue in ophthalmic pathology. And my residency, Dr. Ted Sanders, a graduate of the University of Nebraska, was the uh, pathologist for uh, Washington University. He was in St. Louis, wasn't he? In St. Louis. Mm -hmm. And with my background in, uh, in pathology, he put me to work in the, in the path lab. And I did uh, a lot of uh, path work for him to actually, he had a backlog. He kind of procrastinated and put many many specimens on the shelf and didn't get around to them. He said, clean these up, Stan. <laughs> and I worked for a year or so taking uh, those uh, 
specimens off the shelf and examine them under the microscope and giving him a report. And I, am, I fully intended to come back to Omaha and continue ophthalmic pathology, but Dr. Gifford was so involved that I attended with him a few times, but it was apparent to me that uh, my future at the University of Nebraska in pathology was uh, very limited, so he continued as long as he was chairman. Well, I think uh, one of the legacies that uh, Dr. Gifford had was that his uh, father, the first Dr. Gifford at the turn of the century, was also interested in pathology. And in fact, we have a whole closet full of slides that are left over from that era, and they're still down in the basement of the old building. I thought I'd get around to looking at them, but I haven't seen many of them so far. I wrote a, uh, a paper about, the, about him for an ophthalmic history society. And he was a, one of the earliest uh, ophthalmologists who became interested in um, bacteriology. This was back in the 1880s and 1890s, in addition to pathology. And uh, was a, he was a very uh, ardent student. He took several journals, foreign journals, French journals, German journals. And, uh, was, was uh, an interesting person, and it's fun to read about how a man in Omaha became so involved in uh, things like pathology and bacteriology. He was authority on, uh, on things that, uh, uh, various types of uh, diseases, traumatic, uh, uh, sympathetic ophthalmias and things like that. Right. A lot of those, a lot of experience in the people in the Civil War with those, uh, with that disease, which is virtually unheard of today because of our differences in how we can handle things. But I remember Hal Gifford telling me one time uh, when he was growing up, one of his responsibilities was he had to feed the rabbits that his dad had out in the cage in the backyard because they were using those <coughs> animals to study these uh, bacterial uh, infections in the eye. His father experimented in many ways. Uh, he even tried to, uh, to, on Sandy's, that was B. Harrell's older brother who became a, a famous ophthalmologist and professor at Northwestern. Dr. Gifford Sr. tried to graft skin from one of those kids to the other arm really? back in the early when they were just small children. He, he also... Wanted to get them before their immune system built up, huh? Well, he, he wasn't successful, but he was yeah. experimenting and trying to, trying to graft. He, <laughs> I don't know whether this is, should be part of this thing, but I'm going to tell this story about Dr. Gifford Sr. And, uh, he did many cataracts, and at that time they didn't have sutures. So he operated over the, he turned the patient to, around so that the head of the patient was at the foot of the bed, and he had a low railing. And so he operated right in bed. And uh, they uh, put a patch on that, and those patients got, uh, were immobilized, so to speak, for about a week following the uh, operation so that the wound could heal. Uh, during that time, and this doesn't have much to do with... Uh, I, this is a story that has to be told. My, uh, <laughs> my training in history, but the patients were older patients, and because they were immobile and couldn't get out of bed, uh, many of them became constipated. And Dr. Gifford thought, I wonder if I feed them Vaseline, it might be helpful. So he took a, a container of Vaseline home, and as his children came to dinner with a tongue blade, he would have them stick out their tongue and he would put a large glob of Vaseline on their tongue before they had their dinner and tried to follow their, uh, their bowel habits. 
and he wasn't sure, so then he transferred this same type of treatment to these patients making Vaseline sandwiches. These were not very well accepted by the He's patients. He's not making this up, by the way. And then the, as the patients were discharged from the hospital, the nurses would clean up their rooms and uh, get ready for the next patient, and they would find hidden sandwiches under the bed, in the bureau, in drawers, and all over the, the room as they had rejected his method of treatment. <laughs> that's, re that's going back quite a ways. Wow, I'll say. But that's, uh, that's a well-known story that, um, that uh, really has stood the test of time. But um, um, tell us a little bit about when the clinic, uh, the third floor clinic um, was expanded. I know they got some help from the Alliance International. To well, beginning, uh, we had a, a regent who was, uh, happened to be a lawyer and was very prominent in uh, the Lions, both locally and internationally. And he persuaded the Lions Club here to be supportive financially uh, for the laboratory and uh, the eye clinic. Uh, by that time, Dr. Gifford had a technician who worked in the uh, eye pathology lab preparing his sections and so forth. So uh, we had, uh, at the end of the, uh, of the clinic, uh, we had this lady, Mrs. Lipp, who did all the uh, the eye sections and how uh, Gifford then read them. The eye clinic uh, became more and more involved with uh, uh, the eye, uh, the, uh, the Lions became more and more involved with the eye clinic and so when the time came that we moved our clinic from the hospital up to uh, 40th and Dewey, the uh, Lions eye bank took over a section of the building in the basement and uh, established the, uh, the Lions Eye Bank and several of us were on the board. Dr. Filkins was very involved with it because he was one of the first to do uh, corneal transplants. And the Eye Bank was uh, very helpful and very supportive financially and in many other ways as, uh, we, we, as the department grew. It's interesting that uh, they moved the eye bank at the time I was uh, involved as a uh, interim chairman, and they were developing uh, new uh, geographic areas for clinics in the uh, uh, hospital. As uh, they were adding on uh, clinics for orthopedics, clinics for uh, cardiology, clinics for pediatrics, uh, but there wasn't any for ophthalmology. Uh, I went to the Chancellor, uh, he was actually the dean at that time, and said, we need to stay here with the hospital. Ophthalmology is part of medicine and we don't want to be a satellite up on a hill away from uh, medical school. Uh, well, they didn't have room for us and they moved us anyway into a building that had been previously used, I believe, for pediatrics, and it was ill-suited for uh, ophthalmology. It was uh, small, low ceiling, small rooms, and uh, we used it uh, as our ophthalmology clinic for a number of years. Uh, it was uh, not something that we were very proud of, and as a matter of fact, when we had visiting professors, uh, I chose to show them the hospital and the various things on the campus, but I seldom took them to see the eye clinic. It wasn't uh, something we were very proud of. Well, it did have the one positive factor, and it, it had a parking lot, and parking was a real problem in the other. It had a parking lot and had the eye bank under in the basement. Yeah. Sure did. Well, um, since... Um, I've been wondering, um, you know, as an ophthalmologist, um, uh, we're certainly um, uh, make a good living, and um, but not to the level where we can do philanthropy. 
uh, as you've done, not only for ophthalmology at the national level, but, but locally. So, uh, and you'd mentioned uh, your early relationship with, uh, with uh, Congressman Buffett. And I was wondering um, if that carried over somehow and was related to your um, uh, becoming a philanthropist. When I uh, met Congressman Buffett trying to get into my early service uh, obligations, I had no idea he had any children. <laughs> but uh, as uh, later developed, uh, uh, we had a uh, internist and cardiologist on the staff of uh, Clarkson Hospital who was a, a friend of uh, Warren Buffett's and they both worked on uh, Warren's miniature railroad. And they were together one day and Warren said, I just have got to find out some place where I can raise some money. He was in the process of asking family and family friends and so forth to uh, invest money in a partnership that he was developing. The, uh, the physician said, well, I'll go down to the Clarkson Hospital and see if I can get a few people interested enough to come and hear you give a talk. And we met uh, in the uh, Mallard Room of the uh, Hilltop House at 49th and, uh, and Dodge. Had about uh, 15 or so uh, members of the Clarkson staff. He made his pitch. He told us how he intended to handle these partnerships and how the money would be and among other things said, I won't tell you a thing that I'm doing till the end of the year when I give a report. You'll find out whether you made money or not, but I'll guarantee you 6% interest. The next morning at the hospital in the coffee room where uh, the surgeons gathered between cases, uh, this was a subject of conversation. One of the elder staff members, Dr. Phil Redwick, uh, was uh, gray-haired and rather pontifical and said, uh, oh, he said, I don't think I'd investigate with this kid. Nobody knows him, don't know what he can do. He may make a million bucks and leave the country. Whereupon several other members of the staff said, yeah, it's not for me. But some of us did invest with Warren Buffett and through the success of his uh, work during the ensuing years, it enabled us to develop a, a financial ability to uh, philanthropically contribute to the medical school and to other things in the Omaha area. And so uh, the uh, the I Institute is in large part due to the fact that uh, I was fortunate to invest with Warren Buffett. And in the present time, there's a 300 and some million dollar cancer hospital being built on the campus, the Nebraska Medical Center campus. And that's going to be called uh, Pamela Buffett and a uh, nephew in relation of, uh, of Warren's had the money to uh, sponsor this uh, and be the principal donor in the building of the, uh, the new Buffett Cancer Hospital here at the University of Nebraska, which will be of tremendous uh, value and importance to the reputation of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Well, I, I know you won't bring this up, but um, um, in addition to being a past president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, I believe you're probably the largest benefactor to, to uh, that institution. Um, am I right about that? 
largest single benefactor. Yeah. They send me a note every once in a while, but they, I don't know if they actually rate them. <laughs> uh, one, two, three, but I've done, I've been supportive of them for years uh, in their annual uh, uh, money raising uh, efforts. And, and a wonderful museum of uh, the history of ophthalmology going back to the, to the very beginning of time almost. Well, uh, I was involved after I served uh, uh, on the board and as president of the academy and uh, for a while in the foundation I was involved in a, a uh, committee, a kind of a historical committee, a museum committee. And uh, this evolved into two or three types of uh, committees and one of which was the archives in which we attempted to uh, gather all the archives of the academy going back to 1896 when it started. And uh, we've attempted to bring all those up to date and digitize it so that we can use a computer. You can use a computer to go to the academy and look up uh, things that happened in 1910 or 1930 or when have you. Also, the museum developed, uh, Dr. Fred Blody, who was chairman in Iowa, was uh, largely responsible for the museum. And we have a uh, uh, museum in our academy headquarters that has over 30,000 artifacts and continues to develop them. So we have the archives of the academy and the, the Museum of Ophthalmology, which uh, collects uh, all sorts of artifacts relating to the past, uh, instruments and uh, histories and so forth. And it's uh, something we're all proud of. Well, uh, I was involved after I served uh, uh, on the board and as president of the academy and uh, for a while in the foundation, I was involved in a, a uh, committee kind of a historical committee, a museum committee. And uh, this evolved into two or three types of uh, committees, and one of which was the archives, in which we attempted to uh, gather all the archives of the academy going back to 1896 when it started. And, uh, We've attempted to bring all those up to date and digitize it so that we can use a computer. You can use a computer to go to the academy and look up uh, things that happened in 1910 or 1930 or when have you. Also, the museum developed. Uh, Dr. Fred Blody, who was chairman in Iowa, was uh, largely responsible for the museum. And we have uh, uh, museum in our academy headquarters that has over 30,000 artifacts and continues to develop them. So we have the archives of the academy and the, the Museum of Ophthalmology, which uh, collects uh, all sorts of artifacts relating to the past, uh, instruments and uh, histories and so forth. And it's uh, something we're all proud of. Well, I should say. Well, this has uh, been extremely interesting, and um, I definitely want to thank you for, um, for everything that you've done for ophthalmology and everything that you've done for the Med Center here, and, um, and also for coming here and um, telling us a little bit about it. So thanks again. Well, it's been an interesting uh, experience to uh, come to uh, the University of Nebraska Medical Center and to see, well, I must give credit to Dr. Harold Moore, who came as dean about 15 years ago and was responsible for many of the new buildings that have uh, developed on the campus. Uh, he uh, became friends with Dr. Uh, or, uh, Mr. Charles Durham, uh, who was a philanthropist, was a, apparently a, a, a very rich man. And we have two uh, uh, 
research towers, re Durham research towers, we have Durham outpatients, and we have uh, various other buildings on the campus that uh, have been uh, rejuvenated, rebuilt, or are new. Uh, I'm reminded of a story with uh, Dr. Moore was talking to Chuck Durham and said, well, we're having problems, we don't have enough uh, parking. And Chuck said, well, what, what's over on that area right south of uh, and west of the nurse, old nursing home? By the way, when I started medical school, there were only three buildings here, the north building, the south building, the hospital, and Conkling Hall, which was the nurses' building. And well, right west of that Conkling Hall, Chuck said, build one right there. Really? So we got the parking lot as a gift from, uh, from Mr. Durham also. Wow. Uh, he uh, did many, many things. That, uh, I, I've had the uh, experience of uh, serving on, uh, on several search committees for deans. Uh, as I mentioned earlier to you, one was Cecil Whitson where the chancellor and Roy Holly, who was an OB man, the three of us finally met over uh, at a restaurant on Leavenworth. And Cecil was one of our committee. So we met uh, kind of behind his back, so to speak. And at the conclusion of that meeting, the three of us decided that we would pick Cecil Whitson to be. And he was a, a preceded uh, uh, Dr. Moore in having uh, bricks and mortars and buildings. Uh, it was a great, great choice. Bill on the, uh, on the campus. And subsequently I saw on about four other dean committees that too. They all did pretty good, but didn't quite to do what Cecil did. <laughs> well, he certainly did a great job and uh, also very outstanding was uh, Dr. Moore as well. Do we Is cover there anything uh, else you want to talk about? I don't know the that thing had some uh, Well, he mentioned uh, the fact that uh, the University um, Medical Center in Clarkson finally joined uh, when I was when they built the Clarkson Hospital. I can remember whether it was just a row of houses and they built Clarkson Hospital and it was just north of Dewey. And uh, the people on the board of directors, including uh, Peter Kiewit and Bob uh, Storrs, uh, were very protective. The Clarkson was down at 26th Street, and they built the new one here, and they wanted to keep it separate from the medical school. As a matter of fact, uh, Mr. Storrs drew a line down the street, center of the street, and said, this is the medical school, and this is Clarkson, and uh, never the twain shall meet. Oh. <laughs> well, time, time takes care of things like that, and uh, in recent years, we've had a, a, a joining of Clarkson with the medical school, the university hospital, and so forth, all into one large, uh, unit which I think we can all be very proud of. As uh, Dr. Moore used to say, we are one of the largest, uh, uh, we have one of the largest employee uh, lists in Omaha. We contribute greatly. The medical school uh, and the medical center and the hospitals contribute greatly to the economics of the city of Omaha. Absolutely. And, uh, we're all very proud of that. So the Medical school has grown in uh, stature, in size. Uh, we do have a new chancellor now who's continuing that uh, growth effort. And uh, it's something that uh, people on the campus are interested in developing, uh, to quote uh, Dr. Moore, a world-class uh, medical uh, school and institution and I think we're well on our way to doing that out here in the Middle West as example of the Ebola unit we have Absolutely. and uh, uh, various uh, 
things. This new cancer hospital will make us a cancer center, uh, hopefully uh, uh, competitive with MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, and things like that. So that's uh, been interesting to watch uh, the development and growth of uh, this uh, medical school. I have, uh, I graduated, as I said, in 44. And I don't have many classmates left, but if I could bring uh, one or two of them here, uh, I could lose them in a hurry over across the street as they tried to navigate from, <laughs> from one area of the medical center to the other. It's uh, the old uh, lecture halls and the old uh, clinics and so forth that are all changed, and we can all be very proud of uh, the things that are happening. Oh yeah, it's been great. I um, didn't hadn't mention it, but uh, in addition to the uh, academy, I was uh, uh, proud to have served as president of the American Ophthalmological Society. And uh, this is a smaller society uh, with an invitational uh, form of uh, well, you're much too modest. Let me interrupt here so that people understand that uh, actually uh, you're probably, um, at least uh, up until a very recent time, probably the only person from the state of Nebraska who was selected for that society. No, I've got to correct you there. Okay, I'm sorry. What? Howard Morrison and Harold Gifford, I Jr. See. Well, that's right, yeah. So there were three of us, okay. yeah. But it's a, it's a pretty select group, though. Yeah, well, it is uh, select, and I was proud to serve as president. And as a matter of fact, I received their Howell Medal, which is a, a rather prestigious uh, award that they give once a year to members. The first one going to uh, Kolker, the one who developed cocaine, or oh, uses really? an eye anesthetic. He is the first Howell Medal recipient. Well, they might want to take it away now with the uh, reputation of cocaine, but... Uh, well, that was... Uh, <clears throat> he gave that report back in the 1880s, and it wasn't until the 1920s when he was given the, the Howe Medal, so... Uh, well, one thing I wanted to interject and mention, too, is that the American Ophthalmologic Society is more than just a social group, prominent people. It's a scientific group, and... Um, and I think that's uh, well, worth noting. Yeah, it, uh, they have uh, an excellent scientific program. They now have a, a symposium on various subjects. Uh, they're interested in education uh, also. And uh, it's uh, the oldest uh, specialty society in America. It started in 1854 in New York City, uh, limited to 225 people, and uh, it's been uh, fun and an honor to uh, to have been um, invited to write a thesis, which you have to do and have your thesis accepted uh, to become a, an active member of society. They have interesting uh, nationally known lecturers, uh, the present uh, head of the NIH came, came and gave, us, gave a lecture one time several years ago, and he's the one that researched and developed the f human genome really? and completed it. And uh, we had a talk, and he got up in front of this August group, many of which had gray hair and were older, and he said, uh, any of you physicians who graduated before 1980 will, know, will not know what I'm talking about from here on. <laughs> that we talked about genes and, and uh, genetics and all the things that have happened in that area. Well, he was certainly right about that. Yeah. Anything else you think we need to talk about? Well, <clears throat> Dr. Haven, who was somewhat instrumental in this, made one notice that 
I would find it very difficult to comment on, and he said, what's going to happen in the future? My, uh, my personal time in ophthalmology has been uh, wondrous. Uh, I saw the development of uh, sulfonamides, uh, antibiotics, uh, corticosteroids, uh, contact lenses, intraocular lenses, and gene therapy. And these are so many important parts of what medicine is and developed over my the span of my medical lifetime that it makes you wonder uh, what next? What can they do? It, it's a little like the fellow the story of the fellow who ran the US patent office. He accepted uh, patent applications for the US government in the patent office in 1893. He made the statement 1893. I think we can probably close the patent office. Everything's been invented that can be. So Isn't what's go so what's going to happen in uh, medicine and ophthalmology over the next uh, generation, the next two generations? What's what our children and grandchildren will experience is uh, something that uh, is wondrous to behold. I should say. I'm, I'm very proud of uh, how things are going with the new uh, Eye Institute. Uh, we're developing more full-time people. Uh, we're developing a new outpatient surgery uh, area through the uh, benefit of uh, Dr. Fritch and uh, in the new arts and building. And so uh, the uh, we have a new College of Public Health. Uh, we just see uh, increasing new things develop all the time. Sure do. That make you proud of, uh, of what's going on. Good. Are you guys fine? Is that a good ending? I guess so. <laughs> and you can still make it to Rotary. Oh, yeah. I'm going to make it. Yeah, I've got, I got plenty of time. Yeah, I don't know whether Thane had any other things here. Yeah, he asked why I chose a career, and I explained that getting into pathology. I have Clarkson. Uh, Did you want something like how is, well, he kind of answered at the end, how has ophthalmology changed throughout his lifetime? Well, um, I how, it's, that would, uh, how it's changed, you say? Yeah, I think that would take a long time. To, uh, that's a, that could be yeah. an hour long. Well, the things I just mentioned were kind of large uh, developments in ophthalmology over my medical lifetime, uh, the antibiotics and the lenses and so forth. I'm sure there are going to be continuing changes, but uh, Dr. Gifford, if he could return, would be amazed at uh, what happens. And, and uh, Dr. Thane just came back from uh, Haiti, yeah. Haiti, where he was down volunteering his time and doing cataracts. And they go into these uh, third world countries and, and they do hundreds of cataracts. Uh, we grew up. And they put lenses in. Too. And put lenses in that, that uh, lenses in this country might cost uh, two or three hundred dollars, and they cost ten dollars or less in Nepal or India or Haiti or various uh, places. So uh, the uh, Orbis, which uh, which was developed uh, by a friend of mine who had the, uh, David Payton had the idea, has an operating room in a hospital, in a uh, flying uh, operating room. He was instrumental in getting United Airlines to donate a plane. And they fly all over the world operating, doing ophthalmic surgery and teaching people surgeons in various countries how to do this procedure and that procedure and it's been a great expansion and 
has saved the vision of untold thousands. Of oh, I'll say, and the other thing is, is that um, uh, one of the things that's so impressive about the fact that we can put the lenses in the eye, rather than when I started out, we put them on the glasses. And the problem was the type of glasses that you had to, to use in <coughs> order to make that correction were very difficult to wear. They were heavy and very restrictive as far as um, your side vision was concerned. So uh, with the coming of the intraocular lens, uh, it just um, got rid of a tremendous uh, problem. Like you, when I started, uh, you did the cataract and took out the lens, you had to replace it with a big, thick, heavy lens that he's talking Coke about. Coke bottles they used to and, be. Uh, then the next step was contact lenses. Yes. And we used to have a technician who came from St. Louis when I first started, and she would take a mold of the eye, and from that mold create a contact lens that fit over the, the square. Yeah. But it enabled these people to see without this heavy magnifying lens. And then that later came the little tiny lenses that sit just on the cornea, and that was a tremendous uh, uh, change, tremendous improvement. But, uh, so people have ideas and follow through on them, and it's just amazing all the things that are, are developed. Oh, it certainly is. Makes you proud. It does. I did enjoy in my career being editor of the transactions of the American Academy and also the transactions of the American Ophthalmological, which meant I had to read all the papers that were given in those uh, meetings that they had over the years. And uh, it was uh, educational as well as fun. But it also enabled me to make a lot of friends in ophthalmology. Yeah from all over the country and in some cases from around the world. So I've had a very rewarding career in ophthalmology. You certainly have, and a very valuable one for ophthalmology as a profession and for all of us that um, are coming along behind you. In my case, not too far, but... <laughs>